Hi guys, it is a spectacularly gorgeous day here in the end times in Paradise and St. Croix. We have somehow stumbled into Sunday morning, February 7th, 2016. So this is me and my little cohort, cohort Sancho Panza, bringing you my weekly doomsday sermon where I look at the uh, one of my latest favorite Bibles of the Apocalypse and this Sunday I'm actually doing a second sermon from this this uh, book which is an absolute must read for anybody wanting to understand the global corporatocracy the new world order bringing down a planet and this would be of course confessions of an economic hitman by my Humpty Dumpty tribe hero John Perkins you can find John Perkins all over YouTube probably heard the name uh, if you have not heard this or even if you've only read this book once this is indispensable reading for anybody wanting to know how the world works. And so I'm just simply going to read the preface and the prologue to this book uh, and you to, to whet your appetite and you can take it from here. Um, before I start, the only caveat that I have, my only problem with, with John Perkins is he, like 99.99% .99 of this planet, completely clueless and oblivious to planet nibbling and overpopulation uh, as the single biggest threat to the planet. Completely fails to understand that part of the doomsday prophecy pool, but the man understands the shallow end better than anybody I've ever met. And he's going to explain it to you now and I highly suggest you get economics of an, I'm sorry, confessions of an economic hitman and take it from here. Economic hitmen are highly paid professionals who cheat countries around the globe out of trillions of dollars. They funnel money from the World Bank, the U.S. Agency for International Development, otherwise known as USAID, and other foreign aid organizations into the coffers of huge corporations and the pockets of a few wealthy families who control the planet's natural resources. Their tools include fraudulent financial reports, rigged elections, payoffs, extortion, sex, and murder. They play a game as old as empire, but one that has taken on new and terrifying dimensions during this time of globalization. I should know I was an economic hitman. I wrote those words in 1982 when he was writing another book uh, titled The Conscience of an Economic Hitman. That book was dedicated to the presidents of two countries. This was Jaime Roldos of Ecuador and Omar Torrios, the president of Panama, who both had just died in fiery crashes. I think one, I think they might both have been airplane crashes. Anyway, uh, their deaths were not accidental. They were assassinated because they opposed that fraternity of corporate, government, and banking heads whose goal is global empire. We economic hitmen working for the corporations failed to bring them around so the other type of hitmen, the CIA sanctioned jackals, the CIA sanctioned assassins known as jackals, 
who were always right behind us stepped in. I was persuaded to stop writing that book, I bet. Uh, <laughs> and he tried several more times. And finally, in 2003, the president of a major publishing house that is owned by a powerful international corporation read a draft of that book, uh, what had now become this book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. He described it as a riveting story that needs to be told. Then he smiled sadly, shook his head, and told me that since the executives at World Headquarters might object, he could not afford to risk publishing it. He advised me to fictionalize it. But this is not fiction. It is the true story of my life. A more courageous publisher, one not owned by an international corporation, has agreed to help me sell it. And so I guess it was originally published by Barrett Kohler Publishers and then Penguin Group. Good for Penguin bringing it to a larger audience. Hats off to Penguin Publishers. My publisher asked him whether we actually referred to ourselves as economic hitmen. I assured him that we did, although usually only by the initials EHM. In fact, on the day in 1971 when I began working with my teacher Claudine, she informed me my assignment is to mold you into an economic hitman. No one can know about your involvement, not even your wife. Once you are in, you are in for life. Claudine's role is a fascinating example of the manipulation that underlies the business I had entered. Beautiful and, and intelligent, she was highly effective. She understood my weaknesses and used them to her greatest advantage. Her job in the way she executed it exemplify the subtlety of the people behind the system. Claudine, which I'm sure is not her real name, pulled no punches when describing what I would be called upon to do. My job, she said, was to encourage world leaders to become part of a vast network that promotes U.S. commercial interest. And, and make no mistake about it, this includes whoever is in the White House. If you think they're just talking about Nigeria, uh, pull your head out of your ass when he's talking about world leaders that promote U.S. commercial interest. In the end, those leaders, those politicians, become ensnared in a web of debt that ensures their loyalty. We can draw on them, meaning the global corporatocracy can draw on the politicians in their pocket whenever we desire to satisfy our political, economic, or military needs. In turn, they bolster their own political positions by bringing industrial parks, power plants, and airports to their people. The owners of U.S. engineering and construction companies, meanwhile, become fabulously wealthy. And you understand, although he doesn't talk about it in, in, here in the preface, this is what was going on in 1971. And since then, of course, what has been going on as, is this the center of power has been transferred from the U.S. to China. And so more and more, these U.S. Uh, uh, banks, 
these U.S.-led development banks and aid organizations and all of this shit have been switched to China as the American empire fades and the Chinese empire, I should say, re-emerges. Today, and he's talking uh, at this point about close to 10 years ago, we see the results of this system run amok. Executives at our most respected companies hire people at near slave wages to toll under inhuman conditions in Asian sweatshops. Oil companies wantonly pump, pump toxins into rainforest rivers, consciously killing people, animals, and plants, and committing genocide among ancient cultures. The pharmaceutical industry denies life-saving medicine to millions of HIV-infected Africans. 12 million families in our own United States worry about their next meal. The energy industry creates another Enron. The accounting industry creates an Anderson. And the income ratio of the one-fifth of the world's population in the wealthiest countries to the one-fifth in the poorest countries went from 30 to 1 in 1960 to 74 to 1 in 1995. And now the newest report is the richest 62 people on this planet own as much wealth as the poorest three and a half billion. That is the update to those figures. Alright, anyway, blah blah blah. And we wonder why terrorists attack us. Some that this is this is his uh, kiss off to the conspiracy wackos such as Alex Jones uh, explaining why the conspiracy wackos are on the right track but don't quite have it all the way right. Some, such as Alex Jones, would blame our current problems on an organized conspiracy. I wish it were so simple. Members of a conspiracy can be rooted out and brought to justice. The system, however, and he doesn't capitalize the word system, I'm surprised. It is the system, however, is fueled by something far more dangerous than a conspiracy. The system is driven not by a small band of men, but by a concept that has become accepted as gospel. The idea that all economic growth benefits humankind and that the greater the growth, the more widespread the benefits uh, of, of this growth. This belief also has a corollary that those people who excel at stoking the fires of economic growth should be exalted and rewarded while those born at the fringes, fringes are available for exploitation. This concept is, of course, erroneous. We know that in many countries, I would say virtually every country on the planet, economic growth benefits only a small portion of the population and may in fact result in increasingly desperate circumstances for the majority. This effect is reinforced by the corollary belief that the captains of industry, can you say Bill Gates, who drive this system should enjoy a special status, a belief that is the root of many of our current problems and is perhaps also the reason why conspiracy theories abound. You know, all these conspiracy wackos talking about Bill Gates and J.D. Rockefeller 
and the Rothschilds that if we just get rid of a few of these guys, this system will fail. It will not. Anyway, when men and women are rewarded for greed, greed becomes a corrupting motivator. When we equate the gluttonous consumption of the Earth's resource, resources with a status approaching sainthood, when we teach our children to emulate people who live unbalanced lives, and when we define huge sections of the population as subservient to an elite minority, we ask for trouble and we get it. And their drive to advance the global empire, corporations, banks, and governments, collectively known as the corporatocracy, use their financial and political muscle to ensure that our schools, businesses, and media support both the fallacious concept and its corollary. They have now brought us to a point where our global culture is a monstrous machine that requires exponentially increasing amounts of fuel and maintenance, so much so that in the end it will have consumed everything in sight and will be left with no choice but to devour itself. The corporatocracy is not a conspiracy, but its members do endorse common values and goals, and one of corporatocracy's most important functions is to perpetuate and continually expand and strengthen their system. I would say with a capital of capital S. The lives of those who make it in the system and their accoutrements, their mansions, yachts, and private jets are presented as models to inspire us all to consume, 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 otherwise known as buying their products, what Ayn Rand was talking about in 1957. It is what the global corporatocracy is about. It is selling us their planet-eating shit. No, this is not Atlas Shrugged. This is Confessions of an Economic Hitman explaining Atlas Shrugged. <clears throat> Every opportunity is taken to convince us that purchasing things is our civic duty, that pillaging the earth is good for the economy, which is exactly what it is, and therefore serves our higher interest. People like me, meaning economic hitmen, are paid outrageously high salaries to do the system's bidding. And if we falter, a more malicious form of hitman, the jackal, steps up to the plate. And if the jackal fails, then the job falls to the military. This book is the confession of a man who, back when I was an economic hitman, was part of a relatively small group back in the 70s and early 80s. People who play similar roles are more abundant now. They have more euphemistic titles, and they walk the corridors of Monsanto, General Electric, Nike, General Motors, Walmart, and nearly every other 
major corporation in the world. In a very real sense, Confessions of an Economic Hitman is their story, as well as mine, as their story more than ever. But it is your story too, the story of your world and mine of the first truly global empire. History tells us that unless we modify this story, it is guaranteed to end tragically. Empires never last. Every one of them has failed terribly. They destroy many cultures as they race toward greater domination and then they themselves fall. No country or combination of countries can thrive in the long term by exploiting others. And from there, we're going to go over to his prologue. I'm going to read a few paragraphs from the prologue, talking about this is using Ecuador as just one example of what's going on on this planet, talking about how the planet eaters, which have now switched from under Rafael Correa, have switched from the Americans to the Chinese, but it's still the planet eaters taking out, uh, giving it to the Indians. For them, meaning at this point the Ecuadorian Amazon Indians, this is a war about the survival of their children and cultures, while for us it is about power, money, and natural resources. It is one part of the struggle for world domination and the dream of a few greedy men, global empire. That is what we economic hitmen do best. We build a global empire. We are an elite group of men and women who utilize international financial organizations to foment conditions that make other nations subservient to the corporatocracy running our biggest corporations, our government, and our banks, the banksters behind it all. Like our counterparts in the Mafia, we provide favors. These favors take the forms of loans to develop infrastructure. Can you say the brand new Asian Infrastructure Development Bank joining the, uh, joining the list? These take the forms of loans to develop infrastructure. Electric generating plants, usually hydroelectric generating plants. Highways, ports, airports, or industrial parks. A condition of such loans is that the engineering and construction companies from our own country, now more and more from China, must build all of these projects. In essence, most of the money never leaves the United States, now China. It is simply transferred among banking offices. Despite the fact that the money is returned almost immediately to the corporations that are members of the corporatocracy, this would be the creditor, <clears throat> the recipient country is required to pay it all back, principal plus interest, what it's all about, what the banksters feed off is the interest on the loans. <clears throat> if an economic hitman is completely successful, the loans are so large that the debtor is forced to default on its payments after a few years. This is exactly what the corporatocracy wants. 
This often includes one or more of the following. Oh, I'm sorry. When this happens, when they default on its payments, then, like the mafia, we demand our pound of flesh. This pound of flesh often includes one or more of the following. Control over United Nations votes. The installation of military bases or access such to precious resources such as oil or the Panama Canal. Of course, the debtor still owes us the money and one more country is added to our global empire. Oh, so then he's talking about uh, about this one hydroelectric plant in Ecuador. That just one, and there, and I think Rafael Correa has about thirty more of these things planned. This is uh, him explaining how hydroelectric projects work. The one hundred fifty-six megawatt Agoyan hydroelectric project fuels the industries that make a handful of Ecuadorian families wealthy, while it has been the source of untold suffering for the farmers and indigenous people who live along the river. This hydroelectric plant, and now of course uh, the poster child being the Belo Monte Dam just going online down there in Brazil, this hydroelectric plant is just one of many projects developed through my efforts and those of other economic hitmen. Such projects are the reason Ecuador is now a member of the global empire and the reason why the Shuar and Quechua Indians threaten war against our oil companies, of course under Rafael Correa at his switch from U.S. to China. He is, Rafael Correa, as said the U.S. trained economist, Rafael Correa booted out the U.S. and brought China in in their place. Because of economic hitman projects, Ecuador is awash in foreign debt and must devote an, un, an inordinate share of its national budget to paying this off. And the only way Ecuador can buy down its foreign obligations is by selling its rainforest to the oil companies. And China actually had enough brains as a condition of the loan to get paid back in barrels of oil. That's what it boils down to. Indeed, one of the reasons we set our sights on Ecuador in the first place was because the sea of oil beneath its Amazon region is believed to rival the oil fields of the Middle East. And the global empire demands its pound of flesh in the form of oil concessions. <clears throat> All right. The subtlety of this modern empire building puts the Roman centurions, the Spanish conquistadors, and the 18th and 19th century European colonial powers to shame. We economic hitmen are crafty. We have learned from history. Today we do not carry swords. We do not wear armor or clothes that set us apart. In countries like Ecuador, Nigeria, and Indonesia, we dress like local school teachers and shop owners. In Washington and Paris, we look like government bureaucrats and bankers. We appear humble, normal. We visit our project sites and stroll through impoverished villages. We profess altruism. 
and you say Bill Gates. We profess altru altruism, talk with local papers about the wonderful humanitarian things we are doing. We cover the conference tables of government committees with our spreadsheets and financial projections, and we lecture at the Harvard Business School about the miracles of macroeconomics. We are on the record in the open, or so we portray ourselves, and so are we accepted. This is how the system works. We seldom need to resort to anything illegal anymore because the system itself is built on subterfuge and the system is by definition legitimate. However, and this is a very large caveat, if we fail, meaning the guys getting paid by the corporations, if we fail, an even more sinister breed steps in. Ones we economic hitmen refer to as the jackals, men who trace their heritage directly to those earlier empires. <clears throat> the jackals are always there working in the shadows like Sancho Pons or the Jackal, and when they emerge, heads of state are overthrown or die in violent accidents. And if by chance the Jackals fail as they failed in Afghanistan and Iraq, then the old models resurface when the Jackals fail, young Americans are sent in to kill and to die. And make no mistake about it, uh, who is beyond, who is behind uh, all of these most recent wars who have killed how many thousands of American servicemen. It is the global corporatocracy. And thank you, John Perkins, for spelling out how the planet works in this indispensable Bible of the Apocalypse, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. And so I'm going to wrap up this edition of my Sunday Doomsday Sermon, but I'm actually going to come back with a more light-hearted a more light-hearted look at God on this beautiful Sunday morning. But for this sermon, bye guys. Yes, you little, you little jackal. You don't want to wake up the jackal sleeping in the shadows. <laughs>